Right, can you please keep that applause going for the next very... You've got it going, that's right, sir. Uh, Mr Nick Wallace from BBC Radio Surrey. Please welcome him to the stage. You've changed. <laughs> what happened? Does this tag go off or something? Do you want a curfew? <laughs> the only trouble that we might even get, we're going to move into the back of the room. You're so important, you're so influential and so desperately, dangerously unfunny. We're going to put any risk of anything going wrong way out of reach down the back. Hello. I just want to try something. Hang on a sec. Hello, Brighton. Leather dip. <laughs> Just amusing myself. Right, Brighton, hello, you all right? You owe me 60 quid. Four years ago, four summers ago, I came down here to stay with some friends on a Friday night. I got in my car the next day after a lovely evening, a bit confused and disorientated. It was a lovely summer's day. I drove into the centre of town, tried to get to the A23 back up to London. Couldn't. It was closed off because of the Pride March. We were driving around in circles. I could not get to the A23, so I got confused and I drove off on the Eastern Coastal Road towards Rossingdean. Do you know that? Yeah! Got done for doing 36 miles an hour <laughs> on a dual carriageway. 36 miles an hour on a dual carriageway. In the letter that I got afterwards, because I was zapped by one of those Gatso cameras, you were driving at 36 miles an hour in a built-up area. You know that road? You've got... This massive pavement, and then some hotels which are set back in the distance on one side of the road. On the other side of the road, you've got the English oh. Channel. That's not a built up area, that's the end of the oh. country. No one for 25 metres on one side of the road, no one for 25 miles on the other. Bloody gay pride. I don't want to look like I'm blaming the gay rights movement for my speeding ticket. I'm not. Well, I am. But I was reading about the, uh, the gay rights movement the other day, and this has got a fascinating history. Does, um, 28th of June 1969 is where it all began, the Stonewall Inn. Does that ring a bell? Some fine, upstanding citizens who got fed up with the brutality and the bigotry of the New York City police decided to make a stand. And they kicked off, and it became the Stonewall Riots. A year later, those riots were marked by the uh, Pride marches, which happened in uh, cities across America, which eventually led to the repeal of all sorts of oppressive kinds of laws. And finally, I guess the mainstream acceptance of gay culture in our society, roadblocks in the city centre, and my speeding tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that out loud, <laughs> Maybe I was just driving too fast. <laughs> so it's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Patron saint of vomit. <laughs> so people here are celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Is that a woo in the back? Anyone here actually Irish? There's yeah, a thing, isn't it? <laughs> Let me tell you something about St. Patrick. He was British, I've discovered. No, he was British. <laughs> I've read Wikipedia. <laughs> He, uh, he was quite religious, I think we can probably agree on that one, maybe. And he was around in the 4th, 5th century AD, obviously. After Christ, yeah. And uh, he was a big fan of uh, comedy foam hats with Guinness written on the front. Uh, but you know, not every single national holiday is about drinking. Uh, there's Easter coming up, which is of course the most important date in the Christian calendar. And uh, that's more about DIY, as far as I can make it. You know, more shelves are put up on Easter weekend than any other weekend in the year. And Jesus, as a carpenter by trade, I think would appreciate the irony of that. So yeah, so anyone actually got any Irish in them? Don't have to be properly Irish, got any Irish? You got a bit of Irish in go, go, you You're half Northern Irish. Do you have to make that distinction between Northern Irish and Southern Irish? Doesn't that just make you all British? <laughs> um, I've got a little bit of Irish in me. There's an obvious gag that I was going to make there, but I won't. I resisted. Did you notice that? Really? Um, 
Yeah, my great grandfather was actually a, a proud Irishman. He was a, a proud Irishman in the British Army, um, which is quite unusual. Uh, the only problem with that, he was an Irishman in the British Army in 1920. Keen students of history will know that was around the time the British Army were busy suppressing the Irish Rebellion. Um, but it's all right, he didn't kill any of his countrymen. Thank goodness he was in the Pay Corps. So he was just making sure those that were killing his countrymen got paid. Um, I do actually come from quite a, a long military history. My grandfather was a pilot in the RAF, and uh, he was a pilot in the RAF during the war. This is absolutely true. He was such a bad pilot, he wasn't allowed to go on a sortie. They didn't let him engage the enemy. And I would have thought that given the prevailing attitude to human life at the time, they would have just let him have a go, see what happens. But no, he didn't. Genuinely didn't. My father, he was in the signals, uh, and he actually did go to the Falklands in 1990. Um, <laughs> when things had quietened down a bit. <laughs> and my brother, he's in the Royal Logistic Corps. He's done two tours of Afghanistan. I don't know whether you know the Royal Logistic Corps. They're the supply chain people. Um, they like to think of themselves as kind of the backbone of the army, uh, or as the other regiments know them, the blanket stackers. <laughs> it's actually true. So that's the Wallaces, assiduously avoiding active service for the best part of a century. Um, I couldn't join the army, I made too many mistakes. If you make a mistake in the army, it could be like, I don't know, leading your men into a minefield that you'd previously considered to be a field. <laughs> Whereas, if you make a mistake in local radio, which is what I do, you can get through it quite simply by just saying, I'm so sorry, that was Mr. Brian Bajina, the leader of Tandridge District Council. <laughs> and you get out of it with the, the time check and track. So, um, for instance, you just move on, you say, uh, my sincere apologies there to Mrs. Clitheris. Uh, it's 7.37, here's Phil Collins. It's a desperate situation if you need Phil Collins to rescue it, but believe me, he has many times. My time is actually up, but um, my listeners, I've been engaging with them over the last few weeks, telling them that I'm going to be doing this gig, and uh, I said to them, if it's all right with the guy with the red light on, I said to them, if I read out any of your gags on stage, I'll donate a pound to Comic Relief. So, would you like to hear some listener gags? Yeah. I've, got, I've got 10 pounds for the purpose here. And what I really do, oh, that's a shame, isn't it? I really do, never mind. <laughs> Can I do it, man, at the back with the red light on, or do you really need me to get off the stage? I raised 10 pounds for Comic Relief. I need, I need someone on my side, okay. People power, baby, switch your line off. Okay. <laughs> Right, I need someone who can count, though. Who can count? Is Howie here? Is Howie still here? Can anyone count up to ten for me? Do you, you're Howie. You can be Howie for me, okay? Can you count up to ten? Because I've memorised the jokes, okay? If I don't get to ten jokes, then I have obviously not given all the money that I should do to Comet Relief, okay? So when I get to joke number eight, say two more. Because if, if, I, if I finish my set and walk off, and then you go, no, you missed a joke, it's going to ruin the moment, okay? So when I get to eight jokes, you can count up to ten, can't you? Okay, right. When I get to eight, stop, okay? And I'll tell you what, because I asked them to send in their favourite jokes, there's a good chance that you may well have heard the punchline to these jokes before, okay? Now, I think I'd be on a hiding to nothing if I said, don't shout them out, okay? So what I'll do is for everyone who shouts out the punchline to the joke before I get to it, and it has to be the right punchline to the joke, otherwise there's chaos, and I can't have that. Right punchline to the right joke before I get to it, I'll do it in an, eight, an extra pound to Comet Relief. So it could be up to two whole pounds for one joke for Comet Relief. Woo. All right, first joke is from Angela of Arthur. This is the starter joke, okay? This is a long joke. It's quite easy to guess. Even if you don't know it, you might be able to shout it out before we get it. And we'll raise more money for starving Africans. Okay, red light man, if you get me off early, people will die. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Angela of Arthur. Thank you for your joke, Angela. Um, two cats trying to swim the channel, having a race. English cat called one, two, three. A French cat called un, deux, trois. Which cat won? One, two, three, because un, deux, trois, cat sank. I heard someone put and picked up on that. Okay, we'll make that two pounds. Two pounds for that joke. Uh, okay, this one is from uh, Christine in Rygate. I saw Tim, the RAC driver, looking very upset in his van the other day. He's heading for a breakdown. <laughs> two from Reed in Cranley. Uh, I had to give up water polo after my horse drowned. <laughs> And there's nothing I love more than trying to get myself into a very, very small suitcase. I just can't contain myself. <laughs> oh, that, 
Alexis in Horsham, did you hear about the fat alcoholic transvestite? All he wanted to do was eat, drink, and be merry. Another two pounds for that joke. Are you able to keep tap? Right, this, that's five jokes. The two of them with two pounds attached. That's seven pounds or seven whole pounds being raised here for comic relief right now on the stage. Uh, M, 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 M. Let's go with P. P. P for Patrick in Farnham. Uh, Patrick told me that he was walking through the jungle the other day and he came across a pygmy standing on top of a dead elephant. And uh, he said to the pygmy, he said, what's going on here then? And uh, the pygmy said, I uh, killed it with my club. And Patrick said, that must have been a pretty big club. And the pygmy said, yeah, about 140 of us. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. I'll tell him I got a round of applause. He'd be very pleased with that. Uh, Eric in Aldershot uh, called in with this joke. He said uh, he had uh, a lizard, his pet lizard, which he took to the vet uh, who anaesthetised it. It came out a karma comedian. <laughs> Quite a good joke for Eric. Two from Mick in Redhill. What do you call a woman with a sausage on her back? Barbie. What do you call a parrot under an umbrella in a rainstorm? Polyunsaturated. <laughs> one left, there's one left. I think there are two. I think I've got two left. Oh, right, I've got one left. Does that mean I can't count? I've actually memorized 11 jokes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna donate 11 pounds to cover it early from there. Are you sure? You're just trying to get more money out of me. Okay, fine. Uh, this is from Chief Superintendent Gavin Stevens of Surrey Police. A big cheer for Surrey Police there! Fantastic! Uh, uh, I saw a French footballer playing on a computer game the other day. It was Thierry on Wii. That's a copper joke, isn't it? That's not very really good. And my last one, my favourite one, the one I'll leave you with, this is from Margaret in Guildford. Uh, Penguin walks into a bar, says to the barman, See my brother? The barman says, I don't know, what does he look like? Thank you very much for your patience. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye bye.